Oh, it's good to have you back, Aaron. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. So as a pastor, you know, I've been a pastor for almost 20 years. I know that congregants get a certain image of their pastor, and you probably have a certain image of me. Some of you might think I'm always sweet and kind and I'll never lose my temper and I'm always polite, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, not so much. <laughs> Hate to break it to you, yeah, no, not all the time. I do have a certain sarcastic and snarky side and I'll bet I'm not the only one, Andy. <laughs> Not us, Andy. Yeah, there's a lot of us out there. So someday, I know this is a little offbeat, but someday I'd like to design a car for a snarky, sarcastic people. And one of the things it would do is when you get in and you, you know, you get that little reminder that you haven't fastened your seatbelt. Well, I'd, I'd like it to you know, give me a little, nice little, three little beans. Bing, bing, bing. And then it gives me a minute. If I haven't put my seatbelt on, voice comes on and says, well, if you'd like to die in a fiery car crash, just go right ahead. Don't say I didn't blame you. <laughs> and then I'd like the GPS system that after the third time I've missed a turn, it comes on and says, well, if you're not going to follow my directions, why did you ask? <laughs> I'm going to say, just pull over and ask somebody. In my case, it would be saying that all the time. Because whenever I have somebody in my car, I always warn them, when you drive with me, you get at least two turnarounds. So if you see something you think you've seen before, just go with me, because I, I missed a turn somewhere. It turns out I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Now with the advent of GPS, the use of maps and the use of need to ask for directions is, is definitely decreased. And that's a mixed blessing for some of us men. It's a mixed blessing. We're sad because using a map to get from point A to point B and then folding that map back up exactly as you got it from AAA <laughs> is a guy thing. And we feel a real sense of, hey, that, that lesson my dad taught me really paid off. I mean, needed that, needed that lesson in my life. But it's also not so great because of the direction thing. There's a, a joke. Why does it take thousands of sperm to fertilize a single egg? Well, because the sperm never refused to stop and ask for directions. <laughs> Lost and found. In many ways, in many ways, the entire biblical story, from beginning to end, is a series of stories about getting lost and found. In the Jewish Testament, God's chosen people, they wander through a wilderness for 40 years. And in the Christian text, it's all about those people who were once cut off from God's presence being able to return to it for all eternity. And in our reading, Jesus is talking to the religious elite. In other words, he's talking to those people who believed that they were in God's found and favored club. And he tells them three stories about what it means to be lost and found. First is the comforting story of the Good Shepherd. The one who leaves the 99 sheep behind to go and look for that one that, is, that has gone missing and got away. And then we hear about a woman who had 10 coins and she lost one. And then she frantically cleans the house until she finds it and it's probably under the couch. And finally, the deeply meaningful story of the prodigal child. A child who makes a real mess of their life and, and then makes up a nice speech when they come to their senses, a nice speech to tell dad when they come back home apologizing. But that speech isn't needed because dad's there at the end of the road, watching and waiting. And as soon as he sees the child come over the horizon, he goes running and welcomes him home or her home. Lost and found. We've got a real aversion to being lost. We see it as a sign of weakness. We see it as a mistake. We see it as a wrong turn. And all of those, all of those have negative connotations. But if being lost is so important in our sacred text, maybe that's really not the case. Maybe the state of lostness isn't something we should and can avoid. Maybe it's something we can move into and learn from. In her book, An Altar in the World, author and 
former Episcopal priest Barbara Brown Taylor, she devotes an entire chapter to the practice of getting lost. In one section, she writes about the unexpected good things that can turn, that can come about from the simple act of turning off, taking a detour from an expected path, the things you can find and see, that proverbial road less traveled. Then she says this, this is a benign form of getting lost, I know, but you have to start somewhere. If you do not start choose, choosing to get lost in some fairly low-risk ways, then how will you ever manage when one of life's big, big winds knocks you clean off your course? Yeah. This, I think this would have been a far better lesson for my dad to teach me rather than folding a nap and how to get from point A to point B. I never got good at practicing in those small lost episodes. And those, when those big wind episodes in my life came along, I didn't handle them very well. Almost 10 plus years ago, I was laid off from a job that I just loved. And I was spiritually, emotionally, and physically devastated. In some ways, I'm still recovering from that loss. We need to practice in the small ways so that when those big ways come, we know how to handle them. One of the things that these stories tell us is there's different ways to become lost. <clears throat> Did that little sheep wander off because somebody left the gate open? Did a predator come along and spook everyone in the herd and it got separated? Or did that little sheep go off looking for purple grass? <laughs> to uh, get that. It's a famous sermon by Reverend Frieda Smith, Purple Grass. The sheep wanted, knew that it existed and wanted to go find it. That woman who lost the coin, did she simply misplace it and then fall off? Was it an accident or was she careless with it? We can become lost through the actions of another person or another situation, something outside of ourselves some external circumstance, or we can become lost through our own actions or inactions, our own addictions, our own prejudices, our own problems that we create. Brown Taylor says it can happen anywhere in all kinds of ways. You can get lost finding your way home. You can get lost looking for love. You can get lost between jobs. You can get lost looking for God. Think for a moment in the silence of your heart. Think for a moment and for a time when you were lost. Or maybe you're feeling that way now. What happened? How did you get there? What did you learn? Looking at my own lost episodes, that sounds like a good TV show, Paul Anway's Lost Episodes. <laughs> Maybe they should stay lost. But looking at my own lost episodes, one of the things I learned is that there are a lot of angels out there. Amen. There are many angels out there in the wilderness, and there's way more angels than there are wild beasts. And I found that I didn't need to be afraid of everyone. I, everybody that I came across, I could, I could have a sense of trust, I could allow myself to be vulnerable, and in doing that, I discovered that people were very, very willing to help me finding my way back home. And I also discovered that there's a lot of other lost people. That's what MCC has been all about. Finding those lost people. It's people that could not or would not, or were not able to find their way to God. And in my life, there was a lot of people that were in the same boat, and had been in the same boat. And when I found the boat, they showed me the way in, they gave me a seat, they welcomed me, and they helped me put my life back together. And more importantly than, that, than the fact that all, there are all of these other lost people, these once was lost but now and found souls knew how to help me precisely because of what they had gone through. So their experience of being lost was 
what I needed when I was lost that came across their past. Again from Barbara, there are people all over the world who know how helpless you are feeling right now when you're lost. And plenty of them would trade places for you in a minute to be sitting in a wilderness where there are no bombs going off and no guns being fired. And if you listen to these people, they may be able to convince you that the odds of your survival are very, very good, even if those odds were against you. There's something holy in this moment of knowing just how perishable you are. Amen. It's part of the truth of what it means to be human. However hard most of us work to not know that. In other words, we don't want to accept our humanness. We want to be God. We want to be the one in control. We want to have the, all the answers. We want to know what to do. And when things don't go that way, we pitch our little hissy fit because what we're realizing is we are not God. We are not God. We are powerless in many ways. And so this is the greatest and hardest lesson about being lost and getting found. The first step is admitting it. Admitting that you're lost. There's a reason that is the first step in the 12-step program. You admit that there is a problem. You admit that you're lost. Now, admitting you're lost, I don't like the way that sounds. My ego's like, uh-uh, I ain't admit nothing. I'm God, by the way. I'm not going to admit I'm lost. Brown Taylor suggests consenting to be lost. What if we consented to be lost? That involves a choice. And when we consent to be lost, we can choose to explore the possibilities that our lostness has brought to us. And one of those possibilities is may maybe life is for you rather than against you. Regardless of all the evidence to the contrary. Maybe there is goodness and grace in the world. Goodness and grace for you and for me. Hallelujah. And so this rock bottom kind of trust is a trust that comes naturally for some people. They just know that there's goodness in the world. But not for me. I need practice. I need it needed to learn younger that I could get lost in small ways and use that experience to help me through getting lost in the big ways. So how do we do that? For us damaged trusters, what if we were to commit ourselves to looking for those opportunities to get a little lost? And intentionally went into those places so that we could build up the spiritual and psychological and emotional strength that we needed for this radical kind of trust for the big things. What if we examined our comfort zones and then took steps to move outside them? That's a way of getting lost. Try something you've never done before. Say something you've never said but always wanted or needed to say. Go to a new place without Google Maps. Take a left turn instead of a right. Take a walk in a new part of town. Apply for that job. Engage with somebody who's very different from yourself. Whenever we intentionally seek out these smaller, simple ways to enter into a new territory, we gain so much that can make us and help us during those times when life plops our house down in the land of Oz. And it helps to know that no matter where we are, there is one who knows where we are. All right. Amen. There is no such thing as lostness with God. All right. We're the one that goes off, right? We're the prodigal child. We're the ornery sheep. We're the coin. We're the keys. And God is the finder. Where can I go from your spirit, O oh God? Where can I flee from your presence? If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I settle at the farthest limits of the sea, you are there. If I take my bed at the wings of the morning, even there your hand will find me, and your right hand will hold me fast. There is no place 
where God cannot find us. There is no place where grace does not abound. The grace of being able to return, the grace of kindness from others, the grace of others helping us show us how to get where we need to be or want to be, help us, helping us to find our way home. And those of us, all of us, who have been lost at one time or another, know how to offer that kindness to the stranger when they come our way. So let us be open. Let us go to those unexpected places. And let us learn. And then, when the big stuff hits, we'll be ready. Would you pray with me? Inescapable God, we give you thanks that you know all about us. Even before a word is on our tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem us in behind and before. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us. It's so great we cannot attain it. And we thank you for your presence and your grace. And we ask that you be with us in the small lostness and in the big lostness. In your many names we pray. Amen. Amen.